Today we're going to do the final drive shakedown pre-race look at the USGP at the Circuit of the Americas. We'll talk technology, including tires, with Paul Henry, the head of Pirelli Motorsport. We're also going to talk Grand Prix image, what will define success for F1 in the U.S., and of course, the racing. And in doing so, I'm not going to insult the U.S. race fans as NASCAR-centric, F1-ignorant, monocell-minded sports fans. I'm leaving that to the U.S. media, because what I've read and heard in the general market media so far is either scary, stupid, or scarce. Hey, anyone remember the last time F1 was in Texas? No, not that. That was the first Grand Prix race in America, 1908, in Long Island, New York. That's a Mercedes, so I guess that must be Michael Schumacher. No, the last Texas F1 race was in Dallas in 1984, in the middle of their July heat. Dallas was one of the nine cities that's hosted a USF1 race so far. Austin is the tenth. Two things to remember about that Dallas race. First, Honda won its first race with its first turbo design, and certainly not their last win. And turbos are coming back to F1, maybe Honda is too. It was KK Rosberg that raced this Williams Honda turbo to the win. He, at the time, was the Kimi Raikkonen of that generation. Cigarettes and drinks all around, boys. The second thing I recall was the enduring image of one Nigel Mansell, fighting heat and racing-infused exhaustion, pushing his failed Lotus to the finish line. The Mansell faint was, I fear, one of those global images of U.S. Grand Prix racing. Like the Ralph Schumacher Michelin tire debacle crashes of Indy of 2005. And Ralph, which Baldwin brother was he? But now with Austin, it's all new. And a new chance for success, redemption, and really hot grid girls. That's them? Uh, okay, A, they call them not grid girls, but Cota girls. What, circuit of the anatomy? B, who designed those grassy old skirts? Oliver Stone? Hey, honey, come over here. And back and to the left. Back and to the left. Back and, that's a bad joke, I'm sorry. And grid girls are supposed to be beautiful. Now look, I know I'm no take home prize, but these Coda girls, I wouldn't f them with Spinelli's dick. It's time to talk USF1 one last time before the actual racing. And we're going to do so with someone I want you to meet, Ian Whalen. Hi, everyone. That was cool. <laughs> so besides being a fan, here's the, here's the gig. Besides being a fan um, and a follower of F1, you know, Ian's the guy that's been behind the camera, doing the editing for Shakedown for a long, long time. And he kind of bailed me out. Pirelli had a press conference with Paul Hembry. And I, for family reasons, emergency, everything's okay, couldn't make it. But Mike Spinelli and Ian Whalen covered it. And we're going to have some clips from that chat with Paul Hembry. But I wanted to talk with you and get the crowd to know you about uh, a little bit of this stuff. So I'm not throwing either wolves. This isn't taking a virgin <laughs> out on a first date. He knows this stuff, but we're going to have a chat. It's not expert stuff. We're just going to talk about what's going on with F1. Thanks. Fair enough, right? Thank you, Leo. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, we're trying. We're trying hard. Um, <laughs> where the hell are we here? So let's start with, uh, with basically the first question. What what should be the image of the USGP? I mean, it's back after a few years. Everyone in the world talks about how maybe F1 isn't appropriate to the US. On the other hand, we've heard comments where F1 is excited to come back. So what is the image? What, what should people think about as the image of American Grand Prix racing? What do you think? Well, I hope, I don't know exactly, but I think that uh, it would be nice if this track can kind of show off what we can do with a fun track that's fun to watch and yeah. great for the drivers and show that we can build a world-class facility and that's something that will be great for everyone, I hope. Well, it's funny because I, you use the word fun and, and I, I'm kind of thinking that the image of America to the outside maybe is one of fun, a little bit of technology and, and just being modern. So, I mean, I hope it comes across as that versus some really over-the-top patriotic flag waving or defensive that we're NASCAR people, we don't understand. I, I, I hope it goes a little deeper than that. Well, I hope that it's not just about America. I mean, it's supposed to be Formula One. Formula One's a global sport, and I hope that it kind of brings a little bit of that flavor to the United States, and that's something that the viewers can enjoy, because when I've gone to Formula One races, that's something that I enjoy. It's, you feel like you're a part of something greater than just that one location. Well, and that's the other part. I, I, I think we've heard a lot of comments about how in America uh, big events matter. So hopefully it's more than just the literacy of the racing. It is an experience. Um, that kind of gets to the point of 
what is needed to be a fan of F1? A and I fear sometimes that, that everyone thinks you need to know the technology or you need to be really up on all the details. Um, when we talked to David Coulthard with the New Jersey Grand Prix that may or may not be happening. I hope so. Yeah, sure. It's, um, <laughs> anyway, David had a different opinion. And I want to kind of cut to him and a little bit of what Paul Hembry said about what they both thought about what a fan needs to bring to enjoy F1. It maybe isn't as complicated as you think. What do people in the US need to know to want to come to this race? Well, Red Bull wouldn't be doing this if they didn't think that it was going to be something that was going to be popular with the, the public. You don't need to know anything about Formula One. If you like cars, if you like speed, if you're intrigued to know what makes uh, Formula One the fastest form of, of closed circuit racing in the world, you know, that's a fact. That's not, you know, we're not just sort of doing that as, uh, as PR. You know, these are the fastest cars around the racetrack and of this type of nature. And the technology is the technology of tomorrow that you'll have on your road cars. You know, carbon fibre was first developed from Formula One, traction control, turbocharged engines, all of those things came because of Formula One racing. We actually find that uh, there's a huge number of fans that make contact with us from the US and uh, it's all, it always surprises us. The, um, they tend to be some of the most knowledgeable F1 fans, I have to say, uh, around the world. You know, the questions we get you know, asked via whatever medium you want um, from the US is actually very, very qualified and, and very, very um, thought out and reasoned. Of course, there's a lot of European purists that would like to see a Formula One format which had, you know, uh, free engines, you, know, you can do what you want with the engines, 1,000 plus horsepower, you know, tyres, whatever you want to do, and you go to the extremes of the technology. There, there are some people out there that believe that's the way it should be. Um, however, if you go in that direction, you, you're never going to get anyone to turn the telly on in India or China or, or other markets where Formula One as a sport is, is competing against uh, well, a lot of your national sports, for example, you know, where they, they want excitement and uh, they want to see something that keeps them attached to the television. They don't want to turn it off and, and go to sleep. So, you know, the, the, you'll never please everybody, of course, and different people have different opinions. But if we're in the entertainment business and sport today is in the entertainment business, no matter which sport you're in, and you're competing against many, many sports. And uh, Formula One doesn't just compete against other forms of motorsport. It competes against... Uh, Soccer, baseball, basketball, and, and cricket. If you're talking India, you know it competes against everything, and you you have to come up with a product that uh, the public has an appetite for. So I think the other question is: Do you think that do you think that F1 is finally ready to commit to America? Because I always used to get the feeling that they take the money, they'd show up, do the circus, and get the hell out of Dodge. And Bernie at the time used to say things. Well, you had mentioned something. Yeah, he just said that he doesn't think F1 really needs America. And now they're talking well we need America more than maybe F1 needs America. So I'm wondering if they're ready to put forth the effort. I hope so, because this is a huge market. And I mean, the potential is here. It just hasn't been fulfilled in the past, I think. And uh, you know, all these manufacturers, well, not as many as we once had, are involved in yeah. F1. And they're all selling cars here. And I feel like if they really got on the ball, they could take advantage of this for their own good. So here are the clues, I think. I, 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 Bernie Ecclestone sounds to be talking a little bit differently. I mean, there, were, there was a bunch of rumors that even with the Jer Jersey thing, he maybe have some money behind the scenes to try to help that out. Um, the teams, Martin Wish Whitmarsh from McLaren, they're all talking differently about wanting, needing to make America work. And the other thing that just happened with GP2 and GP3, although it hasn't been announced as a formal series, these cars, they've talked about bringing a series to North America to have races in the United States, mm -hmm. Um, Montreal, Canada, yeah. and, and South America, Brazil, to create a feeder series to develop drivers. I mean, everyone always talks about we need a U.S. driver, yeah. but the whole idea of being more than just a one-stop, come to our side of the world and get out, goes away if they really do develop a series here. Now, by the way, the scream in the background <laughs> is IndyCar saying, WTF with this. Good. But they deserve it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Isn't this cool, though, if they actually have another series here? I think that would be cool, and you know, I, I believe it when I see it. It's yeah, one of those things. I agree. I agree. But because uh, it's right behind the DTM series that showed up, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. the more you know, world-class racing we could get in the United States, the better. I think that would be excellent. But GP2 in Europe is kind of developed on following the F1 right. races around, so it it gets attention through that. I mean, I I think. It would be interesting to see how they keep the attention on GP2 in the Americas. 
So two things popped into my mind without sounding like a, a know-it-all. Number one, if I'm a non-American driver and I'm racing and spending my money in Indy Lights, I'm so gone from Indy Lights, I would run this. Yeah. And if I'm an American like a Rossi that has a, a, an aspiration, rather than shipping myself over to Europe, I could start to develop a name here. And mm. it all depends on how they're supported. So honestly, the, the, the last thing, if, if I was NASCAR, I would, I would stick it to IndyCar as well and, and sanction these cars and have another footprint in US racing, but also have that international connection with FIA the way they're doing with buying the American Le Mans series. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about if F1 is finally ready to commit to America, what does the US need to do to make this a success? Well, I think, first of all, we need much better television coverage of Formula One in this country. And, you know, I. F1 should be on drive. That would be great. Someone get JF. <laughs> but, I mean, if you look at what Sky and BBC have done with F1 coverage in, in uh, Europe, it's just a lot more interesting. I mean, they spend a lot of time around the race before you even see the race, just shooting all kinds of cool video. It's really well done. I mean, they've won awards on BBC. I'm just getting in my David Hobbs position. Is yeah. this usually? No. I mean, those guys, don't, you know, they're knowledgeable, but they're not even at the races, and it's nothing against them. But, you know, just to have more of a real presence where you could actually get a sense of the atmosphere of the race would be helpful. Well, and I'm, I'm going to take it a step further in complete agreement. But to be frank, I haven't seen any promotion for the race. So what does the U.S. need to do? Well, I know the promoter and Circuit of the America spent like $450 million to build the thing. Yeah. And I know it's awesome. And Mike Musto was there. Maybe you saw that video yesterday. But I haven't seen any advertising and promotion. I haven't seen any mention of U.S. F1 in the general market. All I've seen are things that are in the racing only community. And maybe that's enough well, to they've... get 100 people, 100,000 people there. They but. apparently sold out, but that's probably not good enough for the future, right? I mean, maybe they don't need, think they need to promote this year because they've sold it out. Yeah, I don't want to sound like Marketer 101, but they're building a brand here. Right. Like living in the racing bubble I is not enough. Uh, as Coulthard said, you don't need to be an expert of this stuff to enjoy it. There's the sound. Everyone talks about the sound of an F1 car. It is pretty amazing. There's I mean, the speed. Yeah. It's an experience. It's a big event. Where is that different from football or the Kentucky Derby or any type of experience event? That's true. You don't need to know anything about how horses are bred to watch a Kentucky, Kentucky Derby. Every weekend I watch uh, European football. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Goes with my Spinelli joke up front. I think it's time to finally talk about the racing itself and the circuit. Here it is. 20 turns. I, 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 do, I even forgot. How long is this track? Four point? Three point? I'm not sure. Whatever. Um, <laughs> but it's long enough. It's, it's a good got, size track. It's got 20 turns. It's got everything that Herman Tilke wants in a track. Um, I know we're all going to be fixated on the start finish line and the elevation and the blind corner in turn one, heading down to a bunch of slalom type activities. I'm guessing, okay, and, and we're going to learn as they, they get on track, but I'm guessing that your passing spots, sure, they could be turn one, probably six. Could be nine, definitely into the hairpin. The DRS zone is here, heading into turn 12. And if I get the numbers right, it's um, uh, 650 meters okay. before. So that's about 2,100 feet. So it's longer than a quarter mile, less than a <laughs> half mile. It's a drag race into the corner. I have to say there's huge excitement within the, the Formula One community to, to be coming over to the US again. And uh, certainly everything we've all seen about uh, Austin, and the, the track, it means that everybody's um, really, really looking forward to coming over. Uh, of course, there's a lot of unknowns for everybody coming to a new track. Uh, we went over probably a month or so ago and they just laid the track, I think, 24 hours previously. And uh, we took mouldings, basically, and la laser measurements of the track surface to try and understand what sort of surface we're going to encounter from a tyre perspective. Uh, we then worked with the teams who, who have, obviously, a, a very detailed... Um, simulation of the track layout where we then simulate the effects of a Formula One car going around a track and looking at the, the lateral and longitudinal loads and the energy going into the tyre and combined with, with the information we have on the surface we then create our own simulation models to understand what's likely to be happening to the tyre when it's going around. Having said that, being a new track and we only took the data as I say 24 hours after it was laid, you do get a settling process 
you also risk having all sorts of chemicals coming through the surface because you know when it's first used you, you do tend to get this leaching process and combined with we're going to have quite a few support races there as well which is actually good because it helps the track settle down uh, we could yet have a few surprises, although we, we try and limit those, obviously, through, through experience, of how the tyres are going to perform. It looks a very interesting layout. Uh, I've spoken to some of the drivers who have actually driven on it on the simulators, and they, they say it looks uh, like it's going to be fascinating, and uh, they're all looking forward to coming over. And um, I guess with the championship so, so poised as well, You've got a lot of people in Milton Keynes with Red Bull in England and also Maranello in Italy working flat out to try and find the last tenths of seconds to, to try and make their driver come through as the world champion. So, a lot of tension. First race at a new track. Whilst the layout is, is fascinating, you know, it's quite a high energy circuit. Uh, India is, is the other, obviously, the, the other new circuit we've been to which has a similar situation. The initial data suggests the track is, is quite smooth. It has quite low macro. It's, it's it's got more abrasion than uh, India and uh, Korea, but it's still not up there with the, the more extreme circuits like Barcelona or Malaysia, for example. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that, that plays out on Friday when we get there. But um, for the moment, there's, there's no big shocks or surprises. So I guess the real action is really just down to our boys, Alonso versus Vettel. Yeah. That's where the championship is left. I'm kind of disappointed that Kimi couldn't... Uh you know, pull out a few more wins this year, but you know, these guys are great, so I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what will happen. So actually, hold that thought about Kimmy, because you know, if someone's not fighting for the championship, they got nothing to lose. Right. What do you think's gonna happen with these two guys? And I'm not asking you to make a full-on prediction, but we've got a situation where 25 points for a win, yeah. um, Alonso has to stay within that point differential to get to the last race and be competitive. If Fettel wins, he has to finish fourth or better. To stay and alive. I'm, yeah, I'm not going to do the math as I slide down the grid. Right. So how do you think Vettel's going to approach it, and how would you approach it if you were Alonso here? Well, I have a feeling that we're going to see uh, Red Bull up, up front, as they have been lately. Yeah. And Alonso, you know, he'll pull everything he can out of that Ferrari, and he'll probably be in the top three rows somewhere, or I hope. And, you know, he'll probably have to try to catch up to Vettel, and, or at least stay in touch with him en enough to keep his chances alive. I mean, if he can actually pass Fettel and do better than him, that would be pretty amazing to watch. And I really hope that happens because it'll be a great show. Well, they've been all over the simulators. But as, as Paul Hembry had mentioned, they, they still don't really know the surface. I mean, Pirelli's done their work. They know what it is. But the track still seems kind of green. Plus, they're talking about rain on Friday, mm -hmm. which negates everything. Right. <laughs> and we've got 20 turns. We've got an aggressive guy that, that I'd call a thinker. Yeah. And we've got a car that should work great on this track, but if we're having traction problems, it may turn out to be a bigger dice roll than we know. Yeah, I think Alonso is one of those guys that'll find opportunities. And yeah. if this seems like a good chance for him to do that, because there's a lot of variables here that could play into his hands, I think. At the end of the day, it's still all about managing the tires, isn't it? The driver that's probably impressed all of us has been Kimi coming back into the sport. You know, bear in mind that the tyres have changed, the cars don't have the you know the refueling. You know, he was coming in to a car that now has 150 kilos at the start of the race, which has a huge impact on the way the car handles going going through a race distance. He's come back in with um, the Predi Tire Challenge, where you've got to manage uh, you know wear degradation, wheel spin, and overheating. The big issue at the start of the year was, was probably less about the tyres changing, it was more about the cars changing dramatically. You know, they lost the rear diffusers, the top teams, and the, the two or three top teams lost what we call the flexi noses. They were having a different nose cone with different flexing ratios for, for each track. And, you know, that was something the public didn't really see. Um, and that affected really the aero balance. So some of the top teams had, bizarrely, 20 degrees temperature difference front to rear which is something you never see. You know, you take those same tyres and put them on our what was our Renault test car, 2010, and you'd have three or four degrees difference. So the car was having a, a huge impact on the way the tyres were working, and clearly 20 degrees difference front to rear made it seem like there was two different tyres on the car. In terms of the other degradation, you know, you're aiming really for about one-tenth a lap up to three-tenths per lap. You know, so you want some, if it's aggressive, you want a big performance gain, but you lose three-tenths a lap. And if you want something conservative, one-tenth. Having said that, you know, we, 
the last three races we've been working on hundreds of tenths of you know almost zero well to be honest zero degradation the loss of fuel load has compensated the tire degradation and the tires will be going quicker at the end of the stint so um, and then we got criticized for being very boring so the, the mid range is somewhere somewhere else you know and uh, we had a lot more criticism for being boring than we did for being exciting put it that way yeah you know, these are the best teams in the world the best engineers in the world over a 20 race season there's no chance involved you know you end up with the best engineers coming through and I think from Hungary which was maybe just over mid-season you started to see a pattern developing of, uh, of where the teams were and when you know the questions certain teams were asking you there's no surprise which teams were, were really getting a, you know a, a handle on, on maximizing the, the vehicle and tire performance and uh, uh, I'll give you an example you know one team turned up with a thermal camera looking at the rear tires uh, within two races, nearly every, well, every team has a thermal camera looking at the rear tyres, you know, so um, that's part of the challenge. So Ian, when you met with Paul Henry, pinch hitting for me and I really appreciate it. No problem. You had one question that caught his attention. Well, I was kind of thinking about how the bigger teams and the smaller teams might approach their tyre strategy because the big teams have a lot more tools in their toolboxes than the, than the smaller teams and both types of on, on each end of the grid, they have different uh, needs. The harder tire we had last year, for example, needed a lot of energy input to, to make it work. And what we had last year was really just McLaren and Red Bull being able to use that. So we disadvantaged the vast majority of the grid. Um, this year, going towards the softer compounds, we've, we've reduced that impact. So the aero has been less, let's say, important in, in getting the tires working. Um, of course, as the season progresses, the, the top teams have a rate of development that the smaller teams can, can't really follow, so the, the gap has been slowly increasing as the, the season's gone on. Um, but it, it's not really been a huge difference, I would say, when you're going down through the grid. It's, it's not quite that simple as it was maybe last season. So Mike Spinelli had a question, trying to get a sense from uh, Paul Hembry about the long view of tires and F1 racing. And, and, and Paul grabbed the bull by the horns, <laughs> the red bull, no, forget it, just let's <laughs> run Paul Hembry. If we're able to confirm our presence in Formula 1 going forward, you will see that we, we have a roadmap of um, innovation and technology uh, going forward that will, will be very stimulating. And, you know, road car tyres themselves are evolving in different directions. And I ought to say that we have very different demands depending on which sector we're working on. But uh, the type of things I can maybe just throw out and, and being very generic, though, is things like intelligent uh, cyber tyres where the tire is used a, as a sensor or, on the vehicle. You know, th there's going to be a day in motorsport where, you know, we, we start using those types of technologies to, to interact. Maybe not even with the car electronics, but to, to provide um, our own engineers with uh, operational data of how the product's operating in, in a race condition, or even taking it to an extreme, providing the public with information about how the, maybe the tire's working. So. The world will, will move more and more in that direction. I mean, we can obviously talk about innovative materials, uh, of which there are always many coming along in, in, in the world of motorsport. In terms of tyres, you know, there are two elements. One is in terms of simulation and uh, modelling, which has a big impact on what we do with our high-performance tyres. I mentioned for 2014, for example, that um, if we are in the sport, we will perform the majority of our product development via simulators. You know, we will turn up a tyre model and understand how they perform on the new cars in a virtual sense. And certainly from a, a structural point of view, that works very, very successfully in terms of, of the tyre. It's more complex when you get to compounding because it's a very complex thermal model that relates as well to the surface that you're working on. However, in terms of structure and handling performance, you can get a lot from, from simulation. That is the way the, the car manufacturers are going. You know, the future Ferraris or McLarens you will see will all be developed via simulators in the future. So there is a relevant um, area there where development costs are reduced, but also development times are dramatically reduced by, by using simulated technology. In terms of materials, um, thermal management, you know, in Formula 1 we try and create thermal degradation in one part of the tyre, but there's also a huge amount of thermal stability and other components used in the tyre. That's a challenge that you also have with, uh, with high performance tyres, you're managing the thermal stability of the tyre in extreme conditions. So I'm not going to tell you a Formula 1 tyre is you know, a direct cousin to, to what we put on the, the high performance cars of the world, but there are a huge number of technologies that we do apply through to, through to that business. I'm gonna, I, I am going to put you on the spot, but All in right. an okay way. <laughs> do you think the tyres are too much of the equation right now? Um, well, they're, they are a big part of the equation, but 
it's a lot different now than it was when we had the tire battle between Michelin and Bridgestone where, you know, you could have a great car, but it was all up to the tires going race to race and, you know, some tracks suited one tire better or the other and, you know, it was kind of unpredictable in that way. Um, now, you also don't have refueling now. So yeah, the tires, I think, are the main, are a big factor. And, you know, I don't know if I like that or not, but it is what it is. So Ian, you want to figure out why I have this picture up here while we're talking F1? Well, I think it's some of the other culture of Austin, right? <laughs> uh, you know what? Actually, that's Singapore. Okay. okay. But the point is just, is just that. The F1 race is going to be bigger than just the racing itself. And it's on Austin's shoulders to make this whole trip out there for all these fans an experience. Right. So Singapore and all the other F1 venues do a really good job of having a nightlife right. and an experience to, to the whole thing. And Austin's kind of known for that. I've heard that. I haven't been there, but I've heard that it's kind of like a little cultural enclave in Texas. And, uh, you know, they have all these festivals. Well, one called South by Southwest. Right. That's kind of a indie music film festival tech kind of thing yeah, and yeah, yeah. they draw a lot of people to that and apparently they have good food in Austin. I've seen an Anthony Bourdain episode about Austin and he it looked pretty good. He drank his way through Austin, right? And ate. And yeah. ate, yeah. Yeah, it looked like fun. And Austin's supposed to be almost like not the, the typical perception of Texas. So when all these F1 guys are coming in joking about big cowboy hats and chasing bulls, it's, it's a different type of town. I'm not sure it's all hipster or anything. But it's not the stereotype of downtown Houston or Dallas, right? Yeah, I think there's a, a, a big young population there, and there's a lot of art stuff going on, and you know you have a keep, a, keep Austin weird. Yeah, they have that whole Whatever thing. Whatever that is. They like. I think it might be a little bit of a Portland, Oregon kind of vibe there. But again, I haven't been there, so it's just what I hear. Okay, so not to go negative, but there are a couple of things that that definitely going to kick in here to make the experience work. There's the prices. I've heard some, some things. Yeah, I've heard they're pretty high. I've heard $7,000 for a uh, motor coach parking spot. And then the other thing is access. And they've been pretty open about the fact that the roads coming into this place, there's maybe one or two of them and they're not super highways. And I've heard that um, they've already set up shuttle kind of logistics, yeah. two shuttle processes. The, the locals go one place to get their shuttle bus and the visitors go another place by appointment to get the shuttle bus, but the experience could change if you're three hours on a bus. Yeah, and I hope that doesn't happen because right. it'll kind of put a damper on your weekend if you're looking to get back to your hotel and- Party bus. Yeah, get Party ready bus. for going out that night. Point is, let's find out what happens when it really happens before we pass judgment. You know, Austin is one of those places where, where obviously Leo Hendry believes GP racing needs to be in New York City, but this is a major US venue. Yeah. It's got technology behind it industrially. Um, Toyota has an assembly plant in San Antonio, kind of down the road. So even though they're not an F1, it's auto manufacturing. A lot of assembly plants are down south. They have hotels with... <laughs> I don't even want to comment about that. <laughs> why, why am I looking at that? <laughs> Is that Mike Spinelli visiting uh, the Coda Girls? He might have something that to do with Mike that. was Mike Spinelli visiting the Coda Girls. <laughs> All right. So... Let's not do prediction, but let's, let's do this. What are you looking for to come out of this weekend? Well, I hope there's, a, I hope there's close competition okay. at the front because if, if you have Fettel just taking off and, you know, that's it, then we kind of have a, kind of a non-existent race, right? So a close race. Yeah. And, and, and the place is awesome looking. I mean, look what $450 million can buy you. Yeah, and I hope they do well, and I hope that it looks great on TV and so more people want to go to the next one. So we got into this little discussion sidebar with someone else. Is this for American racing or is this an American statement for global audiences, um, in your opinion? Well, I think it's an American statement for global audiences at this point, but uh, it could develop. And, you know, I'm still wondering, you know, if you have to pick one North American race to go to as an F1 fan, would you pick Montreal or would you pick Austin? I mean, there's, they're going to be, they're going to have different flavors, right? And I've been to Montreal a couple times and I love it. Yep. So, and I hate to say it, but I think if I had to spend the money, I'd still go back to Montreal over this until I see where this goes. Or if I have enough money someday to go to two F1 races in one year, it might be a little while before that happens. We're going to do something special for the, uh, the Austin F1 race during the race. 
And what we want you to do, and let me, tell me if I get this right, guys, come back to youtube.com slash drive, and we're going to set up a live chat mechanism. So during the race, and what, it's 1.30 Eastern time here in the U.S.? Something like that. Something like that. During the race, we're going to chat. Uh, not just myself. Ian may be there. We're going to do a little Google Hangout. Josh, and, uh, and if we're good enough, uh, JF, who is going to the race, maybe he'll be able to kind of give us a on-the-spot type thing as well. That would be great. Yeah? So that's the plan, okay? We do a live chat during the race here at youtube.com slash drive. Ian? Yep, Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sunday. The, the, the F1 race, not the NASCAR race. Right. But we can talk about Keselowski if he, you know. Anyway, point is, <laughs> come here. You were great. Yeah, thank you. Were you comfortable? Yeah, it was good. Did you like it? I had a good time. You want to sit here? Yeah. <laughs> See you later. Uh, of course, you know, Formula One has come and gone in the US many, many times. And there's lots of reasons for that. And there's also a reason that it's maybe not stuck there. So Formula One will have to think about how it approaches, you know, F1 racing and has to learn from, from what the public enjoy in the US in terms of sport. Uh, can I say Pirelli? It's not just Pirelli, you know, it's the sport as a, as a whole that has to look at all of those elements. Uh, I think the track, um, being in Austin, is, is a good, good step forward. It's clearly a, a very good track. Uh, it's been designed very well. The drivers who have been on the simulators have described it as being uh, a very, very interesting track. So uh, at least the, the, the basic infrastructure has been put in, which uh, has maybe to some extent, maybe been lacking in the past. Of course, building on that, we, we need to create an event. And um, I've, I've been personally able to, to follow a lot of motorsport in the US over the years in either Grand Am or American Le Mans racing. And I know the American public has, uh, has a very different approach to, to sports, and motorsport, compared to a lot of the, um, the other circuits we visit around the world. I think one thing that's always struck me is that um, the public very much wants an event. They want an event where it's not simply about just the race per se, it's also about the social aspect, it's also about having time away with friends and family and actually having a reason to go away, and I'm not going to say a holiday, but it's something where they look forward to on an annual basis. So if Formula One wants to grow in the US, it has to create consistency. You have to create a reason for people going to the track and you have to create a good environment, an enjoyable environment for when the people are there. We need to entertain the public. It's just not good enough to turn up with 24 cars, go racing, pack up and leave. And that's something that going forward, you know, as a sport, we're, we're going to have to do better at. And I, I think I have to say that there's a lot of people in the sport that recognize that. And going forward, I'm quite sure we'll do a better deal at uh, bringing in the interest from the American public. Thank mm -hmm. you.